Open in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 34. We'll be there in a moment. Jesus said some very hard things. Jesus said some things that make us wrestle. Jesus said some things that make us struggle. Jesus said some things that I wish he wouldn't have said. If I'm purely speaking from a human standpoint. No one shoot me. I think you feel the same way. Jesus talks about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And that's going to be the topic for today as we are reading through the book of Luke. And we are thinking about these things that Jesus said in Luke chapter 12. He's going to say, whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. That's very hard, isn't it? I want you to think about this idea. And, I, and uh, sometimes when a child asks me this, or maybe a newer Christian asks me this question, what does it mean to be uh, guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? What's that mean, Aaron? Or what's that mean, Dad? I had that question this week. Because if Jesus says you'll never be forgiven for doing this, I think I want to know what it means. <laughs> right? Right? And so I try to make it simple. Now you're going to get the two minute version and then we're going to go into the longer version. So if you get it after two minutes, you can fall asleep. Here it is. If you reject God's way to be saved, you cannot be saved. No plan B. No second option. No like when I'm on Google Maps or Apple Maps, you know, I turn the wrong way and it reroutes you. Oh, I love that. There's no rerouting. It's not like the Holy Spirit says, oh, okay, you want to go that way? I'll change it for you. Ha! Uh -uh. It's not like that. If you reject God's way to be saved, you cannot be saved. Let me put this up there as well. If you refuse God's loving offer and message of forgiveness, it is impossible for you to be forgiven. Is that hard? Is that a hard statement of Jesus? He says something very similar to that. And so what I want you to do, we're, just stay there in Exodus 34. I've got some verses I want to put on the screen. I want you to look at this idea of what Jesus says. I'm going to look at what he says in Luke. I'm going to look at what he says in Matthew and in Mark. And there's some very good reasons why I want to look at each example because it's instructive. Each one through the Holy Spirit records some thoughts in those passages that help us to understand what we're talking about. Like I said, if, if Jesus is going to tell me I'm never going to be forgiven, I really want to know what that means. That is the last thing that I want to do. Jesus said in our reading, everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Is that hard to understand? In, in that he says you won't be forgiven. We're going to explain, we're going to let the Bible explain what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit means. Matthew's account, whoever is not with me is against me. Jesus is binary. <laughs> he is zero or one for the computer geeks. And that's about all I know about computers. Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. That's challenging. Mar or, um, Matthew 12 uh, says, whoever speaks a word against the, the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven when, either in this age or the age to come. We'll keep going. Mark. This one, I think, is the most piercing. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of men and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, what's the next word? Never. You know, we say always and never, we don't mean it, right? Jesus means it. Never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For, 
or they were saying he has an unclean spirit. We're going to look at the context as we study this lesson to explain that statement. So what I have to, what we have to do at this point is say, okay, Jesus said it. And we will, we will be guilty of an eternal sin, so I want to know, you want to know what that is so that we don't do it. Amen? Okay, let's keep going. Exodus chapter 34. We're going to look at, uh, my sermon is one better than Reuben's because I have four points. He has three. <laughs> Just saying. That means it's that much longer too. We're going to talk about four things. We're going to talk about character, we're going to talk about context, we're going to talk about consistency and call. These are all on your outline that's available. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me afterwards. And I also want you to be remembering that tonight, please be here at five, because Reuben's going to talk about the reality of hell. And so this lesson and tonight's lesson go together. How can a loving God even talk about hell? How can a loving, forgiving, merciful God even say you'll never have forgiveness? Is that the Jesus we understand? Is that the narrative of Jesus that we have? Exodus 34. Moses wanted to see God. God says, I'm going to show you my glory. And what he does is he talks about himself. Now, Many people, including myself, sometimes we come into the Bible with a false narrative. We've already got our story in our mind. Then we come to the Bible, and I want the story of the Bible to fit my story. And what we have to do, hopefully we can realize that, the more we study and learn, is to take my story and throw it out the window. When we think about Jesus, I need to let Jesus define himself. When I think about the Holy Spirit that we sang praise to, I need to let him define himself. Let's let the Bible set the narrative. Exodus 34, verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with Moses there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, listen to this, the Lord the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Of course, we also see that he will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, to the Several generations we see. But I want to make the point here. What is God? Who is God? God is merciful. God is gracious. God is slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love and he forgives. Does God want to forgive you? Yes. Is that his character? I want to make a side point about this because sometimes we study Calvinism and we have people who believe that this idea that God designed you uh, to be saved and your neighbor to go to hell. God planned for you, predestined for you to be saved and your neighbor to not be saved. I want us to see that let's not define how God is and then read the Bible. Let's let God talk for himself. God says, I'm slow to anger. By the way, if he made you to be a sinner, who's he angry with? He made you. He gave you a choice. And you make a choice. He's slow to anger and he's merciful and compassionate and full of steadfast love and for, and for faithfulness and forgiveness. He wants to forgive you. Is that your choice to come to him? That's what the Bible says. God's character is loving. Now, Turn with me to Acts chapter 5. The Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is not some mystical wind, some vapor out there, some personification of God. The Holy Spirit is God. Look with me in Acts chapter 5. This is important to understand because we've got to get this in our heads about the character of God, the character of the Holy Spirit. He's God. He wants to forgive us. And he's given us all the tools for us to be forgiven. But if I reject that, if I reject the way, I reject the words... I have made up my own mind about where I'm going to be. Acts chapter 5. We have a, a couple here that eventually they lost their lives. They were struck down immediately by God. There's the God merciful and gracious and compassionate who struck down Ananias and Sapphira for lying. Woo! Acts 
Acts 5. Verse 3, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to whom? To the Holy Spirit and to keep back part for yourself or the proceeds. Verse 5, you have not lied to men. Verse 4, you have not lied to men, but to God. In the New Testament record, it's on your notes, but you can just read through Acts. You can see in Acts 8, the Holy Spirit talks to Philip. In Acts 10, he talks directly to Cornelius. The Holy Spirit is a being. He is God. We have to understand that. That is such an important point. And the Holy Spirit, as you read, and we go through this year, you're going to see this more and more as you study this. Whether you've read it or not, uh, you're going to learn more and more as we go through the year and study Luke and Acts. But look at the book of Acts. Just think about how much the Holy Spirit is involved in the salvation of men. You'll read the book of Acts and what you'll see is the Holy Spirit said, oh, we got the Ethiopian eunuch. He's looking for salvation. Let me get Philip and bring him over there to him. I've got Cornelius. He's looking for salvation. Let me get Peter and go over there and bring it to him. What do we see the Holy Spirit doing? He is trying to connect teacher and student. He's actively involved in the salvation of men. He is revealing the words to the teachers so that they can say the very words of God. Paul didn't have to go study his book ahead of time. The Holy Spirit gave him the words. And then they wrote those words. And so the Holy Spirit has been revealing the will and the, word, the will of God and the words of God through his word. I want you to look with me, if you will, in Ephesians chapter 6. I will never get tired of hearing pages turn. And I've joked before, and I'll say it again, that I wish there was an, when your Bible app would just make the sound. <laughs> it's really encouraging to know. I don't know whether you're looking on Facebook or the Bible. I hope you're looking at the Bible. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is what? It's the word of God. The sword of the Holy Spirit is the word of God. When you hold this in your hands, whether it's an app form or paper form, you're holding the words of God. This is how he communicates with you. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Now, he is God and he works in other ways. We have to understand that the Bible's clear about that and there's more sermons coming on that, but he's not gonna work outside of this word in the sense of contrary to it. He's not gonna work against it. He's not going to tell me one thing in this book and then whisper something else in my ear. The Holy Spirit is God and he works through the word. He doesn't work counter to the word. He works with the word. He reveals the word. When I reject the sword of the spirit, I am rejecting the spirit. Does that make sense? The Holy Spirit confirmed Jesus by miracles, wonders, and signs. When Jesus was baptized, what did the Holy Spirit do? He came down in the form of what? A dove. And God, the Father spoke from heaven, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Hebrews chapter two, turn there with me. Hebrews two, verses three and four. Hebrews two, verses three and four. This is written to people who are, who are thinking about walking away from Jesus. The book of Hebrews is written to people who either have walked away or thinking about walking away. And this is very instructive us. We're going to look at a couple passages from Hebrews in this sermon. But in Hebrews chapter 2, he says in verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect what? Such a great salvation. It was declared at first by Jesus, the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Jesus said something, he proved it with a miracle. Paul said something, he proved it with a miracle. If you say that the miracles, and when Jesus is doing miracles and they say, oh, you're acting by the devil's power, you are rejecting God. God completely. And that's why Jesus said it's impossible to be forgiven. You're rejecting the very power of God. You're rejecting the fact that the kingdom has come. You're rejecting Jesus as the son of God. How can you be saved if you won't listen to the one who's sent to save you? Number one, we have to understand the character of God. And he has emotions. The Bible talks about grieving the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 4. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29 in this same book. 
I want you to look at, it's interesting, the word that's used in the English standard. The word I'm used to hearing is insulted the spirit of grace. These who had rejected, they had walked away. Not that they're sinned, they sinned once or they're struggling with something. They're walking away. They're abandoning Jesus. But in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29, it says, Of how much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has profaned the blood of of covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged? Would you want to outrage God? Today, outrage, everybody's outraged, outraged over the dumbest stuff. You don't want to outrage God. Outraged the spirit of grace. God has emotions. The Holy Spirit has emotions. You read through the whole Bible story. You can reject the Holy Spirit, grieve the Holy Spirit, resist the Holy Spirit, quench the Holy Spirit. Example after example in the Bible. He has emotions. He's God. He cares. He wants to save you. And so let's think about that. Second thing is the context. I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 12. In the book of Luke, as the Holy Spirit is working, as Jesus is working, you have two very distinct groups. You have two very distinct groups in the book of Luke. Both groups heard the same message. Both groups experienced Jesus. Both groups saw miracles. Both groups were offered the same offer of salvation and forgiveness. Both groups had the same opportunity. Yet they had very different responses, Jackson. The great sermon the other night. They had two very different responses. It is so evident in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 12. In verse 8, and I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. You have two very different groups. He also tells his apostles, his disciples, that they're going to receive, verse 12, the Holy Spirit. There are some who are rejecting the Holy Spirit, and there are some who are receiving the Holy Spirit. What makes the difference? And so what I want you to do is to think about, go back to Luke chapter 3. Start there with me. Luke chapter 3. One group asked questions. Jesus told a parable. What did the disciples say? Can you explain that to us? They saw Jesus praying. What did they ask? Teach me how to pray. The other group had a very different response. They questioned him. They attacked him. They tried to find fault with him. They were justifying themselves. They looked down on others. They had no desire to listen to the word. And the more Jesus taught them, the more they doubled down on their rebellion against Jesus. Two very different responses. When John the Baptist came and he started preaching the word of God, John the Baptist comes on the scene and he says, you guys are a bunch of snakes. Well, where do you go for your second point? It's interesting how Luke records this differently than Matthew. Luke chapter 3, he calls them a bunch of snakes. Verse 10, there are people that heard John the Baptist say that, and they said, what? What shall we do then? I don't want to be a snake. And he told them what they needed to do to repent, and they did that. Then he goes into Herod's palace and he says, Herod, you're not supposed to have that wife. You're not supposed to be married to her. What did Herod do? He killed him. Two very different responses to the word of God. It helps us to understand what Jesus means when he says they'll never be forgiven. You're rejecting the very way to be saved. Chapter 7. As Jesus is talking about John the Baptist and how John the Baptist was from God, we see in Luke chapter 7, verse 29 and 30. Luke 7, 29 and 30. When all the people heard this and the tax collectors too, they declared God just having been baptized with the baptism of John. When John came on the scene and called him a bunch of snakes, they repented and they were baptized. They didn't say, how dare you call me a snake? They said, yeah, I'm a snake. And I need to repent. What did the other group do? 
We continue, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. John's Baptist was for the forgiveness of sins. Let me ask you, if they reject the baptism of John, will they be forgiven? Is it possible? Nope. If you reject God's way to be saved, you can't be saved. It's that simple. Then why do you keep preaching, Aaron? <laughs> Consistency, the third thing. Just a little humor. Consistency. There are so many other examples uh, that we can look at. But uh, again, they're all on the bottom of that page. But, but you can see Jesus over and over again. There's one group that lifted up their noses and said, Oh, Lord, I'm, you know, Lord, you are so blessed. I'm on your team. Unlike the guy over there, that wicked person. They, Jesus said, they stood, these Jewish leaders stood in the way of the kingdom of heaven. They stood right in the door and they wouldn't let anyone else go in until they tried. Again, if you stand in the door and you won't go in, can you be in the house? That's the essence of the, part, the prodigal son. The prodigal son repents, he comes home, the older brother's outside. That's the idea. I don't want to be outside the house with God, do you? One group was very different than the other. Third, consistency. What's a consistent message of Scripture that sheds light on the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? I want you to turn with me at 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. Again, I'm just going to reference some of those other passages that are on the notes. But you know, when Jesus saw Jerusalem, what did he do over Jerusalem? He wept. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who stones the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you under my, uh, to me as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I hear it already, but you were not willing. Is there a choice in the matter? Do you have free will? What did Jesus just say? You were not willing. He said, therefore, your house has left you desolate. You can't come in the house. You're not going to have a relationship with me until you change that. The consistent message of scripture, Second Chronicles. Remember the character point. Remember the character point that we first talked about. Remember that. Think about the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers. Why? What's God's character? He had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But what's the response? But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people. If your eyes are on the verse, what's the next phrase? Until there was no remedy. If that doesn't stir you up, I don't know what I can do to help you. There comes a time when God says, that's it. There comes a time when God says, no more. How about the, the days of Noah? Peter tells us, I love how Peter through the Holy Spirit describes us. He says, the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah. Noah's building an ark, but he's not just building, he's preaching. He's preaching, he's preaching. And I can't wait for all of us who are going to go up this summer to see the ark. Because I'm going to tell you, there was plenty of room on that boat for more people. And when the boat was done, the ark's finished. It stays open, the door's open for at least seven days the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, but one day the door was shut. That's it. And there was probably a lot of fingernail scratches on the outside of that, that ark. God's patience will run out at some point. I'm asking you, if you keep delaying your relationship with Jesus, you keep putting off getting right with Jesus, you keep putting off becoming a Christian, there comes a day when it's too late. What in the world are you waiting for? 
If you reject God's way to be saved, it is impossible to be saved. That is the consistent message of the scripture, Acts chapter 7. And I'm not saying these things because I'm angry. I'm saying these things because I want you to be saved. Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. Stephen's last words. He preached a sermon that cost him his life. He preached a sermon and they killed him. And it demonstrates this consistent message in the scripture about rejecting, blaspheming, opposing, insulting the spirit of grace. Acts 7 and verse 51. He says, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised, and hard in ears, you always do what? Listen to this. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? Can you name them? Oh, how about Elijah? Did they persecute him? Yeah. How about Isaiah? Did they persecute him? Jeremiah? Can you just go through the prophets? All of them. And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have betrayed and murdered and you have received the law as, as delivered by angels and did not keep it. We're going to keep reading in a moment. Peter preached something very similar to that in Acts 2. You killed Jesus. You're guilty. The people said, men and brethren, what shall we do? They were baptized into Jesus Christ. They were forgiven. Given the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is a promise of salvation, I believe. And so here they are. They're, they were listened. Peter, Stephen preaches it. And what happens? Do they say, you know what, Stephen, you're right. I need to change my life. You know, that'll show a lot about you is how you respond when you're corrected. Are you with me? It'll show a lot about who you are when you're corrected. How did these people respond? Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged. They ground their teeth at him, but he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. It's interesting. Jesus called himself the Son of Man at the right hand of God. The Jews killed him too. They cried out with a loud voice. And what did they do to their ears? This is critical to understand. What did they do to their ears? La, 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 la. I'm not listening. They stopped their ears and they ran at him uh, with one accord. And then they stoned him and they killed him. That's resisting the Holy Spirit. Fourth and final thing. We understand God loves us. The Holy Spirit is God. That's his character. He wants to forgive us. He is involved in our salvation. He has given us the words and the way to know about Jesus. It's been attested and affirmed with miracles. His consistent message is all day long, I'm stretching out my hands to you. All day long. Jesus' hands are outstretched today. I want you to be saved. That's the consistent message. I forgot to read something in Acts chapter 7. Who's in that crowd that killed Stephen? Saul, a.k.a. the Apostle Paul. Was he guilty of resisting the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. Was he, an approv was, was he approving what they did? Yep. Was he fighting against God? Jesus told him that. You're kicking against the goads. I'm trying to lead you one way and you just keep kicking against it like a stubborn cow. That's Paul. Let me ask you something. Was Paul forgiven? You need to remember that. Sometimes Christians struggle with guilt and shame for sin and wonder how in the world could God ever forgive me? For what I've done. Is it possible? I had a dear friend in Ohio. He passed away recently. 
who had done so much in his life. I've talked about him before. We called him Big Jim. But he, he got involved in drinking and drugs and, and all kinds of immoral behavior. He torpedoed his own family. That was the words he used. I torpedoed my family, Aaron. And he would, he would struggle with passages like this. Have I sinned so much that I can't be forgiven? Have I gone too far? What about Paul? Was he forgiven? God showed Paul mercy, 1 Timothy 1, as an example of the mercy that he wants to show you. But you've got to stop rejecting what he's trying to get you to do. He's calling. I want you to look with me in the book of Revelation. Turn there. Jesus said, the father, we being fathers, I mean, he's like, if you're evil parents, which is, man, I, gee, that was hard, Jesus. He's like, if you're evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the, Holy, the, the, the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Is there, is there a difference? We're looking for it. We're seeking. We're knocking. I want you to notice something in Revelation 2 and 3. I appreciate your patience. Revelation 2 and 3. I want you to notice something. Maybe some of you have already noticed this, but even if you've noticed it, I want you to see it again. I'm going to walk through Revelation 2 and 3 with you. Verse 1, to the angel of the church in Ephesus, what? Right. To the angel in the church of Ephesus, right. Verse 8, to the angel in the church of Smyrna, right. Verse 12, to the angel in the church of Pergamum, right. You see a pattern? Seven times, seven churches, to the angel of the church in, here, right. What was John to do? Take the words of God, put it in pen and paper, and write it and send it to him. I want you to also go back and notice a consistency every time at the end of the sections. Revelation 2, look at verse six, 7. Revelation 2, 7. He who has a, an ear, let him hear what Spirit. the Spirit says to the churches. Do you realize when you read this, you're hearing the Spirit talk? Don't try to listen for it in your ear. Read the Bible. To the angel of the church, every time I'm writing these things to you. And by the way, were those churches in a mess? If you know Revelation 2 and 3, they got a lot of messes. But did Jesus want to forgive them? Yes, but you got to listen to what the Holy Spirit says. I want to come home to Jesus. I'm tired of being a knucklehead. I want to come back to Jesus. I'm going to listen to him this time. I've tried Aaron's way. That doesn't work. You've tried your way. You made a mess of it, didn't you? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We've got to listen to what's written. Don't expect Jesus to do a special favor for you and do it in skywriting if you won't listen to what he already said in his word. Now, you remember the ark door? It got closed. You get to the end of Revelation chapter 3. The church at Laodicea was the church that kicked Jesus out of his own church. He's speaking to the church at Laodicea, but where's Jesus? He's outside. Hey, can I come back into my own church? Isn't that, that's piercing. He got kicked out of his own church. They didn't need him. They were worshiping in the name of Jesus every Sunday, but they didn't need Jesus. And so we see in Revelation chapter 3, he says, I stand at the door and they were, they were arrogant. They, they didn't think they needed Jesus, but where's Jesus? Knocking at the door. But you have to understand one day you won't hear the next knock. Don't ask to hear another sermon when you've already heard a thousand don't ask for another Bible class when you didn't listen the first 20 times. He's offering salvation to you now. Come now. And so as we think about what the Holy Spirit says 
some of the very last words in the Bible, the Holy Spirit says, come. You've got to come. You've got to come to God on his terms, not your terms. You've got to listen to what the word says. Not what you want it to say, not what I want it to say, but what it says. And you will be forgiven by Jesus because he is merciful and he's compassionate and he wants to bring you home with him. I hope that you'll think about these things. And as we're about to sing, let him have his way with you. If you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, come forward while we stand and sing.